beyond human semblance. Beyond human semblance. Of all the verses of sacred scripture that we hear in this beautiful celebration of the Lord's Passion, what strikes me the most, what haunts me the most, what brings me the most to tears of sorrow and love is this prophecy of Isaiah that our Lord during his passion would be beyond human semblance. That he would be so beaten, so marred, so disfigured that we would not even be able to recognize him as a man. When Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, came out in theaters, shortly after seeing it the first time, I remember hearing a priest say in his homily, Mel Gibson did a good job, but I believe he fell very short of what it was really like. And I remember thinking, you must be joking. He's trying to be funny, right? How could it have been much worse than that? Perhaps some of us think, I barely made it through the movie. But as tortured as our Lord was depicted in that film, he was still not quite beyond human semblance. So we can meditate a little deeper about what it must have been like for him to be beyond human semblance. The first thought that comes to my mind is color, the color of his skin, of his body, the thought that he was so, so beaten, he was scourged so much, he was spit on so much, struck so much, that he was a completely different color than we would normally recognize on a human person. So much black and blue, so much purple and red, the red of fresh blood, the black of dried blood, the blue and purple of bruises all over. I imagine no part of his body without its bruise, blister, cut, or torn off flesh. The next thing that comes to my mind is shape. The idea that our Lord was so tortured that his body seemed to defy human proportion and texture. Isaiah prophesies, I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. We can imagine that after the majority of our Lord's body was disfigured by the scourging, as he's being bullied by a whole cohort of Roman soldiers, as they're mocking him and pretending to honor him as their king, Perhaps one of them steps forward and says, hey, in order to be our king, he has to look like us. Got to do something about that beard. The Romans were clean shaven. And so we can imagine them one by one taking turns, pulling out different parts of his beard until all that's left is a series of red bumps and this texture that perhaps resembled scales more than skin due to the irritation and the swelling. Then the crown of thorns. During a presentation here at our Chapel of Divine Mercy on the Shroud of Turin, the Holy Shroud of Turin, I remember hearing that it was more like a helmet of thorns covering the whole top of his head, not just the headband area, and imagining those soldiers striking him over and over with that reed that the thorns would be so embedded in his scalp that we couldn't tell where the thorns began, where his head began, all together as if it was the shape of some unknown creature. Then his eyes, after so many blows to the face, so many punches, completely black and blue, swollen to the max, hardly able to open, and perhaps whatever visible of his eyes flooded with blood from burst veins, burst blood vessels in his eyes. 
We thought that with that looking at them, we wouldn't be able to recognize them as human eyes. That can't be a human face. It must be some monster. What is that thing? Isaiah describes him as one of those from whom men hide their faces. The thought comes to my mind of a certain movie of The Phantom of the Opera. There's several different movies depicting the story of The Phantom of the Opera, and in most of them, at one point or another, they reveal his face. And seeing them, I'm like, that's it? Come on, it's really not that bad. But there's one version where they never reveal his face. The whole, they reveal it to certain people in the film, but the audience never sees his face, and it just leaves this lasting impression that indeed it is all too horrifying, it is all too shocking that we wouldn't be able to take it. At one point, the phantom himself says, I have no face, only the semblance of a face. This was our Lord during his passion, not only his face, but his whole body beyond human semblance. Our Lord Jesus Christ, beauty himself became unbearably ugly, unimaginably ugly, as he took on the ugliness of our sins. But all for love, all to reveal a love beyond human semblance. Yes, those words that can convey such horror can also convey such beauty, the beauty of Christ's love for us. Our Lord let his body become beyond human semblance to reveal to us a love, his love for us beyond human semblance. A love that is able to look on us with the hideousness of our sins and still see the beautiful image of God. Our Lord is able to see us with the ugliness of sin and nevertheless remain madly in love with us. Not only desiring to see us, to look on us, but to touch us, to embrace us, to kiss us and unite us to himself. Our Lord transformed the ugliness of his passion into the most beautiful manifestation of his love. A manifestation that is only paralleled by his presence to us in the Eucharist. Yes, let us recognize that at Mass, our Lord, in his ongoing love for us, his non-stop love for us, once again and over and over again becomes beyond human semblance. With the appearance of bread and wine continuing to reveal to us a love so divine, a love unlike any we're gonna find among men. So as we venerate the cross, as we kiss the body of our Lord depicted on the cross, and as we receive him in Holy Communion, may we be filled with the same sentiments of St. Alphonsus Liguori. You died for love of me. I long, my beloved Jesus, to die for love of you.